Hi everyone. Um, Alon is giving uh, the second part of his talk with Daniel today. Um, so thank you Alon for giving this talk and uh, the floor is off. Okay, thank you Michael and uh, for the third chance to talk in this seminar. Um, so no before I start- Who owns the ceiling? I don't understand this. Who owns what? Ceiling. You said the ceiling? floor is yours, but who owns the ceiling? You know, you must uh, figure Me out. too. Here it is. You must figure out this one at some point. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, without further ado, let me just say that this is the second talk in the series of two talks uh, me and Daniel uh, are giving about Kirchberg's QWP conjecture and its relation with Silson's problem. Now, the first talk was already given but uh, it contained a lot of stuff. So I will start with reminding the, like only very little of what if we did, but uh, as we go on, I will remind the relevant things that uh, for us that we will need to establish this relation. So just to remind you what we gathered to do, um, the goal of, of this talk is to finish uh, connecting Tillerson's problem so this problem with Kirchberg's QWP conjecture. And this in turn relates the study of quantum correlation, different correlation sets modeling quantum mechanical experiments with the rich theory of C-star algebras, uh, which is kind of a deep mathematical theory. And this in turn will relate also to problem with the famous Kohn's embedding problem uh, which is actually equivalent to Kirchberg's conjecture. Uh, but uh, for, for, for the purpose of this talk, we will almost not talk about Kohn's embedding problem at all. And our main objects will be tensor products, sister algebras, etc., and not von Neumann algebra. Uh, and okay, we, we started like the whole last lecture, we gave a lot of like uh, the a crash course on the theory of C-star algebras and the machinery involved. So now I will only remind you of, uh, uh, like very briefly remind you of what we were discussing. Uh, the, thing, the first thing I just wanted to make sure is still in your head is, is the formulation of what is Silverson's problem. So recall that we denote so-called Bell scenarios where M is the number of questions and K is the number of answers. This will be fixed throughout the talk. And we had the notation of Q tensor product gamma for the set of tensor product correlations or co also called quantum spatial correlations with this number of inputs and outputs. And similarly, we had the quantum commuting correlation set with this number of questions and this number of answers. So the first one was uh, arising from like tensor products of POVMs on different Hilbert spaces. And the second one came from one single Hilbert space and POVMs on. And Silson's problem asks whether it's true that for any Bell scenario, so for any number of questions and answers, the closure of the tensor product correlations coincides with the quantum commuting coefficients. Uh, okay, so uh, let me also remark here again that we will prove, will prove is closed and convex. I mean, you could potentially say that maybe the closure is even bigger than the uh, quantum commuting correlations because it's not closed, but uh, in fact, we'll prove today that the, the the right-hand set is closed. So this question makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay, moving on, unless there are questions. Right, um, my, my philosophy in this talk okay. is I, I will, yes? Uh, yeah, so uh, I should know the answer to this question, but mm -hmm. for, uh, for finite dimensions, is it easy that they are equal or? Mm. Yeah, exactly. So for finite beam, uh, finite dimension, you have equality for any Bell scenario. Um, 
there is something to prove, but this is not very hard as far as I understand. However, we are always talking about separable probability, Hilbert spaces. So uh, the talk will rely heavily on the fact that we're, we have like- infinite. Can you say a word about how the finite dimensional case is done? Just, just a hint. And so, so I confess, I haven't really sat down to, to see this and most authors when they, they just say it's kind of a trivial, like the, the thing you need to prove is that um, I guess if you have like a set of commuting uh, for say for simplicity projective measurements, okay, so really uh, projections on a finite dimensional Hilbert space, if they commute, then you can find some tensor product splitting. Um, it might, it might also, yeah, that's, that's all I can say. I'm sorry, I, I, I haven't seen the actual argument, but uh, hopefully we'll see it sometime. Well, some, but, uh, something that's not about the proof, about the actual yeah. fact. I mean, can this, mm -hmm. the finite dimensional case be stated in terms of pure linear algebra or something? I think it, that's what I, tr I, I thought would be true is that indeed if you have like uh, just uh, two sets of commuting projective measurements, like this is linear algebra, right? Then you right. can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, separate it into a tensor product. So I, I, this, that, this shouldn't involve any functional analysis if that is your question. Um, great. And another Can thing you do I want with the associated algebra. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no problem. Can't you do it with the associated algebra to the game? Yeah, so this was what I. Uh, so, so I'm let I'm I really am less familiar with uh, with like all these. Um, I'm pretty sure you can do it, but uh, probably Michael has a better answer for that. Like. Um, yeah, like uh, whether you can see it as, it's probably just finite dimensional representation to a certain algebra, but uh, still I don't, I don't, I can't say for sure, um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it follows. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll mention another thing about a question Nati asked last time, which I will give a partial, not really give a partial answer, but mention that um, you might ask what about Okay, so we know Citizen's problem is false, right? It's not true that any, any number of questions and answers this has a, there is an equality. So a prior, we only know that there are some K and M for which like um, uh, these correlation sets differ. However, there, like uh, there's an article by Ozawa. Uh, I will also give a reference to it later. But, which is titled on the Quantum Bedding Problem, which says that once this, this statement is false, then for any, I think, number of answers, there exists a sum M such that inequality. So if you know that this, a, like if you know that there exists some M and K which differ, then you know that for any fixed number of answers, for a large enough number of questions, there will be an inequality. So in particular, there is an infinite amount, uh, but this is really non trivial. I mean, it passes through the equivalence to Kohn's embedding problem and some further works by, uh, this uses more um, analysis, more careful analysis. But uh, I don't think, uh, whether there is a full characterization for which, uh, for whether all of them except two, two different. Like today we will see that if you take M equals K equals two, then there is equality. Okay, this is kind of a degenerate case. Okay, so if there aren't any more questions, I will move on to remind what is Kirchfeld's uh, conjecture. So the formulation now should be a bit more a um, less less cryptic because we saw uh, what are the definitions of like we saw that there are different definitions for tensor products of C star algebras, 
However, today we will want to really introduce what is this one, this guy over here, which is the CCR algebra of the free group. And uh, the point being is that if you knew there is a quality here, then Silverson's problem would be a uh, verified. So in fact, there isn't an equality, uh, an equality and we will uh, try to prove today why. And why, why this conjecture would imply Silverson's problem. So the, the, the whole discussion today is about the quality of maximal minimal integrals. Okay, but uh, so, so now a very brief reminder of um, what we call C-star algebras. So the whole, so I will give a definition, but very quickly I will give like a very strong motivation for why this should be related at all to, to POVMs and such. But then, um, Simply put, a C-star algebra is just a unital closed star subalgebra of BH, where H is a separable Hilbert space or, or finite dimensional. Uh, so closed in the sense that it's closed in the operator norm and unital in the sense that it contains the unit of BH. Now that's nice and good, but there is a better kind of better in some sense definition of a C-star algebra in, in the sense that there there is an axiomatic definition. Okay, because at the end of the day, a C-star algebra is an algebra equipped with an involution operation denoted by the star and the norm. Now, these three structures, like the norm, the algebra structure, and the adjunction, uh, have a certain set of axioms which are verified by BH with the, the operator adjoint and the operator norm. And so they also pass to any such closed up sub object. It turns out, however, that if you verify this list of axioms, then you can really be realized as a sub algebra of BH with these properties. Um, this was also alluded to by Daniel last time. Uh, and we'll see later why I do need this axiomatic definition in D, but uh, we won't really use it explicitly. So just keep in mind that you can define C-star algebras without reference to BH at all. Okay, but uh, some, some two simple examples, which we also mentioned last time, if you take the whole algebra in particular matrix algebras, uh, they satisfy the definition and the second type of algebra, which is important for us, because it will appear in a second, is you can consider the n-dimensional Euclidean space as just diagonal matrices inside the, the n by n matrices, right? And this will be a commutative algebra because multiplication of diagonal matrices, the order doesn't matter. And this is, okay, it's finite dimensional, but it's already commutative. And following Nati's question last time, we also mentioned that this can be generalized for any compact metrics, compact metric space. You can do an analog of this construct uh, of this algebra also here. And okay, but moving on to maybe justify, okay, but uh, just before I say something about how it relates to correlations. I remind you that we define the special, not special, but a kind of a general type of a map between a C star algebra and BH. So, or general, you could also replace it by another algebra B. But then for our purposes, we will talk of what's called a unital completely positive map or UCP for short. And these are maps that start in a C-star algebra and end up in BH, okay? And as a slogan, these maps were more general than just preserving the whole structure of a C-star algebra, what's called a star homomorphism. They are compressions of star homomorphism. So we call such a map phi, a UCP map, if it is the compression of a star homomorphism pi from A to BH, where A to BH hat. Maybe I'll delete this so that the hat will be visible, where H hat is a larger Hilbert space. So then grammatically, if you will, 
and we have A, right? And we have this map P, which is valued in operators on some Hilbert space. However, it is not necessarily multiplicative. It's just a linear map. Uh, well, if you require it to be multiplicative and preserve the adjoint, it's what's called the star homomorphism. But here we are considering a such fees with um, less restrictive property in the sense that they can kind of be dilated to a star homomorphism. So I have some star, so this is already a star homomorphism, this thing, okay, which goes to a larger Hilbert space. And then I compose it with kind of a compression. So a compression, which takes an operator A to the orthogonal projection onto H, a pre and post composed with A. Okay, now it, it, th this definition, um, you might remember it, it might not, it doesn't really matter, but for the sake of our lecture, it's just some, some nice definition of a map from a C star algebra to the operators on some Hilbert space. Uh, but any questions so far? Something worth clearing up? Feel free, because I'm, I am compressing quite a lot of stuff here that we did see. Is there a nice way to see that uh, <coughs> a map is UCP? You know, I don't know who mm -hmm. H hat is. You just show me yes. this map and I should somehow come up with an H hat yes. as a compression. Yes, so I want as I remarked last time, this isn't the usual definition of a UCP map because it's kind of not really canonical, right? I chose some dilation. There is a definition that doesn't rely on this larger Hilbert space, uh, which explains the name completely positive because the definition is reminiscent of checking that the function is what's called positive definite. F uh, group, like there is a classic theory of in, harm, in abstract harmonic analysis of positive definite functions on groups. And the, the actual definition of UCP maps is very reminiscent of that one. So it's some checking the positivity of some matrices, but uh, I won't write it down right now, um, if that helps. Uh, but yeah, in general, it's, it's, uh, it's a more flexible notion of, of not necessarily a star homomorphism, but you can first, but you can compress it. Uh, but there is also a natural uh, definition that is a positivity assumption. Okay. But uh, okay, moving on. Hello, uh, now Ken. Yeah. This positivity assumption. This is, I mean, is this something that you can like, uh, at least for finite dimensions? Is there like a, an algorithm that? takes a, a map and tells you if it's a UCP or is it something like for all uh, tens of products, this something is positive? So you know? it's a good question. And um, I think for finite dimensions, you can compute it, although it's not apparent for the from the definition, but really the, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, these UCP maps uh, are consists of a whole theory, and uh, there are a lot of structure theorems for it. If it tells you anything, uh, I think in quantum information theory, uh, the, uh, the, the adjective used for UCP maps is quantum channels. Uh, yes. So th there are certain structure theorems and like Klaus operators and Choi, Choi matrices. I mean, there's a lot of ways to describe them. But uh, I mean, you would need to decide which, in which way you present me a UCP map. But in general, it's like a, it's it, right. there is something to check. Yeah, right. I'm not so, sure. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So there, you can do it with a yeah with with, with um, more uh, an finite algorithm. dimensional yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like um, but uh, yeah, but it's relevant for both the finite dimensional theory and the more infinite dimensional. Okay. But the next slide, I think, will really justify why we are even talking about uh, UCP maps, because this is really the relation between 
uh, C star algebras and correlation uh, and um, say measurement in quantum information, it reads as follows. By the way, I didn't say at the beginning of the lecture, but both lectures are based on a very a extensive and nice article by Tobias Fritz from 2012. Uh, and this proposition in particular is taken from there. And it reads as follows. Given an arbitrary Hilbert space H, the following are true. If you give me an M outcome P PVM, okay, so now it's not just a a positive operators, but really projections and they are all mutually orthogonal, then this defines a star homomorphism. So here it's really a multiplicative map, pi from C to the M to the H. So here I'm treating C to the M with the structure of a C star algebra, right? We mentioned that you can think of it as diagonal matrices. And the, okay, the property of this star homomorphism is that it sends the IF basis vector to the IF projector. Okay, so this is just a dictionary of translating a, what is a PVM. It's just a homomorphism from this canonical commutative algebra to our Hilbert space, uh, to our bounded operators on this Hilbert space. Okay. The second thing is really why UCT is coming is the exact same statement, but with POVMs, uh, what with POVMs instead of PVMs. Okay, so now they are not mutually orthogonal anymore, and here the map that maps the IF basis vector to the IF positive operator will only be a UCP map from C to the M to BH. Okay. And then just to keep in mind that UCP maps generalize star homomorphisms in the same way that POVMs generalize PVMs. And so I hope this slide is clear because uh, this is uh, one of the main points of, of the correspondence. Okay, are there any questions about this? Okay. Uh, I will also mention that I proved it in an earlier lecture, so uh, it's not very hard, but it, uh, it requires some explanation, especially the second clause mostly. Uh, but this was a correspondence for one, for just one POVM or one PVM, right? I, but uh, usually when we measure, we have a collection of PVMs, right? One for each question. So we want a different algebra to model that. Like for now, the, the main figure was just C to the M, this commutative diagonal matrices algebra. Now we will want to take a k-fold free product of that algebra, okay? So what, what does this proposition read? It says that if you have a k-tuple of n outcome POVMs, okay? So we have k questions and n answers, then you can define a map from the free product of these algebras. So here is k times, okay? And here I'm kind of putting under the rug the construction of the, the, the right construction for the free product of C star algebras, but um, similarly to groups, you can just think of it as um, it, for each, for each um, C to, for each copy of C to the M, you have a basis vector EIX and I can multiply uh, and they, these EIX and EJY have no relations. Okay, it's not like they commute or anything like that. And because of this freeness, um, we are able to define because like just, in, just as in our definition of correlation sets, we do not assume any relation between different POVMs of different questions, right? And, and here we will have the same type of formula, just that the IX basis vector is sent to the IX uh, POVM, 
the sorry the ix of positive of uh, so this is the ultimate correspondence we need so we pass from talking about povms to talking about ucps from a certain algebra like this thing is just determined by the tuple mk which we call the, the bell scenario and um, is this clear or should i say something more Don't feel shy to ask questions because, uh, yeah, okay. So, this so, is, uh, mm -hmm. so far we have in the picture just one player. Yes, this free product. And this, the whole point of kind of this lecture is, these lectures is POVMs and PVMs, they were defined for different Hilbert spaces, right? It wasn't like what we are doing here essentially is packaging everything to one universal object. Like maybe people would say even categorical in some sense that we're packaging the information of all POVMs in the world to just maps from a certain object to something. Okay, so this is just mathematically a nice way of packaging our information uh, and makes it uh, also amenable to tools from CSR algebras. Uh, okay. I think we've cleared that up, hopefully. Is, is there no, a reason, yeah. is there a reason why it's, it's denoted by asterisks and not by direct sum? It, it, from yeah, what I understand. The reason is that when you usually write a direct sum or a direct product, you ask for the different copies to commute, right? This is a relation. You ask for, when you take a direct product of two groups, you require them to commute, but here we want no relations. It's like a certain free construction. And this is also alluding to why the free group will play a role. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so asterisk is just borrowed from the group theory. Uh, okay, and now I kind of want to pass back to discussing the theory of C-star algebras uh, by reminding you uh, the theory of tensor products so we did it last time, but I think it's beneficial for us to see it again in, in case that anything wasn't uh, cleared up. So I will go at a certain pace, but just ask me anything. Um, so, okay, uh, oops. So as we said last time, given two C-star algebras, we would like to define what is their tensor product. However, there is no canonical way to do so in general. Uh, there are two very natural constructions, one called one maximal in some sense, and the other one minimal. And, um, but everything stems from starting with the algebraic tensor. Like uh, the C star algebras are in particular vector spaces. So it makes sense to first take the tensor product of them as vector spaces, forgetting any other structure they have, okay? So what, what is the definition? The algebraic tensor product of A and B denoted like this is, the, is, defi is defined to just be as, as linear spaces. The vector, space, the vector space tensor product of A and B, and for those who don't, uh, haven't seen it, it's a span of certain formal a te small tensor products of uh, elements coming from A and B. And now, in order to make it an algebra and to make it a star algebra so that it will have an involution operation or a junction, we define the natural multiplication rule of just multiplying coordinate wise in some sense and adjoint, taking adjoints coordinate wise. Okay, so for a very small example that uh, Michael. Uh, I think Michal said he presented at some point, I think in the first ever lecture of this seminar, is for example, if you take the tensor product of two matrix algebras, you get the corresponding matrix algebra of uh, times the size. So this is like the classic Kronecker product. Um, but uh, here we just treat it generally and the crucial component of, of, of what, we, what we kind of need here 
is what's called a universal property. So let me draw something and then explain. So here we have A and here we have B. Imagine you have some BH, okay? And you have two homomorphisms, pi A and pi B to this BH, okay? So for the sake of um, maybe relating to correlations, you can think of pi A and B as just C to the N or something that is encoding these PVNs. And if, if you think of this really like this, you can think of just two sets of PVNs, right? And now we say that, so if pi A and pi B commute, so this is saying that the, these two sets of PVNs commute with each other, then now I can package it into again, one object, pi, uh, so I can package both pi A and pi B into one homomorphism from the algebraic tensor product to the Hilbert space, okay? Like here A is, is canonically identified inside the algebraic tensor product and so is B. So here A is sent to just A tensor one and B here is sent to one tensor B. Okay. So and we said this that pi A and pi B commute if for every A in A and B in B, pi A of A and pi B of B commute? Exactly. So okay. this was kind of relating to your previous question. You asked me why do I not denote it by direct sum or direct product? This is the construction that gener that that uh, corresponds to a direct sum uh, to a direct product, more correct. Like here, we impose the relation that they commute, and before we had no relations between the the sets of PVMs. Okay, so again, like here, universal properties are is a general thing, but uh, just think of it as being able to take um, the commuting homomorphisms and packaging them to the, alge to the algebraic tensor product. Okay. So now I will relate it to, uh, so this was just an algebraic tensor product. The problem with it is that, okay, maybe, do you want more time to just look at this for a second or is it clear? I think it's fine. Great. Okay. So, um, so as we remarked last time, the algebraic tensor product, the problem is that it's a star algebra, so it has multiplication and adjunction. However, it doesn't even have a norm, right? So we need to specify something in order to make it a C star algebra. So the way of going about such things is we define C star norms on this algebraic tensor product. That is, we want to define a norm on this vector space that satisfies the following two axioms. So these are part; these are the crucial parts of the uh, list of axioms, if you will, in the axiomatic definition of a C-star algebra. And if we complete it so that it would be a Banach space, uh, then we get by the magical um, this thing that I. I guarantee you that this is a C star algebra. Great. Okay. Like, so, like I mm -hmm. said the last time, there's a redundant. Um, redundant, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. No. Okay, great. Yeah. So this was what we wanted to do. And now I want to present the first construction at which we mentioned at the very last part of the uh, uh, last time, uh, which is to define the maximum norm on uh, the maximum tensor product. So what did we do? We defined the norm denoted by max of x to be the supremum norm of operator norms of pi x, where pi runs over all star homomorphisms. So the keyword here is O. And these are stumble homomorphisms from this algebraic tensor product to BH. Okay. Uh, 
So assume for a second that this is well defined, meaning that this supermoon is a, is a, is finite, uh, because we're running over like uh, all representations. Um, then it would inherit the C star ident the identities, the relevant identities from this norm, from the operator norm, and uh, we will be able to complete this algebraic tensor product to get the maximum tensor product. Okay, but uh, maybe really to digest what this norm actually does, we might as well prove that it's well defined. So what do I mean by that? So let's look at this remark. Fix an element X, which is a finite linear combination of pure tensors, AI tensor BI, okay? And fix, uh, and, and let pi be such a representation, which we are running over in this super. And now, okay, like we define pi A to be the restriction of pi to the A part, and pi B to the, be the restriction of pi to the B part, then because these are star homomorphisms defined on, a C, on C star algebras A and B, it is magically guaranteed that they are contracted with respect to the norm, right? This was a fact that we mentioned that, C, that star homomorphisms defined on C star algebras are automatically contracted. As a result, we get that if you measure this norm of pi x, this will be less than this by the triangular inequality. However, just by definition, this is the, this is the operator norm of the following multiplication. And because it's contracted, this, this is less than norm of AI, and this is no, less than norm of BI. And on the right-hand side, you get a bound that is independent of the representation so that the supermoon is indeed bounded by this finite number. And, okay. And assuming this, this is okay, uh, let me mention what really is special about this maximal tensor product. Once we define this norm and complete it, the whole point the whole point of, of the definition of the maximal tensor product is for it to have the same universal property as the algebraic tensor product. So the same diagram, the exact same thing we drew before. So we had like pi A and pi B. You can glue them together, assuming that they have commuting ranges to a homomorphism of the maximal tensor product. And this really is kind of a by definition because by definition of the norm, a all star homomorphisms pi would be continuous on the algebraic tensor product, and so we can extend it to the completion, which is the maximum. But uh, this is all you need to remember from the definition. And in particular, we will get, uh, I'm cheating a bit here because I didn't define to you what this is yet, although we defined it last time. In particular, we can get, we get a factor map, a quotient map from the maximal one to the minimal one. Or there will actually be a quotient map from any a such completion of a C star norm on the algebraic tensor product, but never mind. We get such a quotient map. So in a sense, the maximal one really is bigger than the minimal one. And we write such an equality which is the, such an equality appears in the conjecture we mentioned in the beginning, uh, if this map is an isomorphism. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, just, just, a, just a comment. You say, you know, you call it the maximal product and it's not clear what is maximal here. So the maximum, what is maximal is the sort of the set A tensor B. The norm is sort of minimal uh, in order to allow as many elements in A tensor B. No, actually it does make, it is largest because such a map Remember, recall that I said that any star homomorphism is contracted. So 
if yeah. you take A tensor B, if, if you take some element here, X in the algebraic tensor product, mm -hmm. okay, the whole point is about norms of elements of the algebraic tensor product. And so Q of X will be X, okay? Because this quotient map is just mapping the, the copy of the algebraic tensor product in the maximal one to the copy in the minimal one. And so the equality you get from Q being contractive is actually that X, the minimal norm is less than the maximum, norm, right? Because this is Q of X. Right. So it does go in the intuitive direction. Um, okay, so something is still not intuitive to me at least. Uh, yeah. If, so somehow, so if this norm, if the maximal norm is bigger, yeah. in some sense, you expect it to include less elements. Less elements have finite norm. No, every element has a finite norm. This is exactly what I proved before, that every element in the algebraic oh, it's, tensor it's true that the, uh, yeah. What you sequence, is the, it's sorry. harder for a sequence to be Cauchy. Uh, uh, to be Cauchy, yeah. yeah, exactly. This is true. Yes, uh, yeah, that's what less I mean. Se less sequences uh, converge right, uh, so, under this norm. Yes, uh, and that's why it's somehow so You should fast. think that that's why this thing has a map to something, right? Maybe. Mm. You need to complete less points. So yeah, then, exactly. You know, like uh, 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 superfluous. Yeah, so if you increase the norm, points, you know. need to add le fewer points when you. Yeah, this is true. The... And this is why you can still have a map from this object to other objects that are still completions with norms that are possibly smaller. But the important point is that because ah, you should okay, think of but, it as. But... But that then you don't expect it to be surjective. You expect it to be. You don't need to be surjective. You just need to be to have the uh, a, a map to any other completion of the tensor product. Yeah. Actually, guys, it's right that it's subjective and it's kind of. I, I, I agree. It's counterintuitive. Then, I mean, this Q will be a quotient map because. Um, specifically from a max b to a mean b because you can show that you cover all this is because the tensor the algebraic tensor product is dense in both yes and otherwise this will not be a continuous map so, so unless this is non-continuous th this should be subjective right should be subjective for any yet I, I agree that the, the, I see Guy's confusion, but I also agree with my, what Michael says. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we agree that, um, that less Cauchy sequences in, in the con converge in the maximal norm. Uh, and so we can kind of define a map from it to anything else. Yeah. So, yeah, until that point, I agree. Yeah. Although, can you recollect mm -hmm. quickly the mean product? Yeah, exactly. So I said I cheated yeah, because maybe. I, I will do it next slide. But first, I will. I guess we will do a break. Okay. Yeah, but maybe maybe let's just think what is the most natural thing to act on. A acts mm -hmm. on some Hilbert space H of A, and B acts on some Hilbert space H of B. So the most natural thing is letting A tensor B act on H A tensor H B. Mm -hmm. And if you think of this, uh, the, now you have the operator norm of uh, H A ten, the B of H A tensor H B, and you can complete with respect to this norm. So it's, this is also a very natural thing. Both of them are very natural. Exactly. So this is so this slide, uh, which came after because I wanted to present the property, but this is exactly what Michal said, that the minimal construction is first. 
a letting A act on its Hilbert space HA and letting B act on its Hilbert space HB. And then looking at like the, if you want to think chronicle product of these matrices, but just the, the algebraic tensor product can be realized inside the tensor product of Hilbert spaces, tensor product of operators. Uh, and then you can complete it and get another completion of A tensor B. Uh, but this will not have the universal property of the maximal one um, a prior. And so it's, it still is a completion, but it's, a, it's, it's in some senses even more natural, but it's a less, maybe a, even you can say less well behaved, but um, it's just another construction. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we will do a break and then we'll discuss group C arguments, uh, which really okay, comes so, now to the three group, yes. Yeah, so let's uh, reconvene at uh, five o'clock. Okay. Oh. I'll have to leave. So you already defined for a POVM a uh, you defined an associated uh, uh, sister algebra. Mm -hmm. or, uh, well, amorphism, more correct. Amorphism, fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so now if you have two POVMs, one for mm -hmm. Alice and one for Bob, mm -hmm. um, so now you have Two, two of these morphisms. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then what? And then you, uh, yeah, okay. So can you tell me what is the yeah. question about these morphisms? Exactly. So, so the first question, first thing you need to specify is whether these POVMs are on the same Hilbert space, right? If they are on the same Hilbert space, yeah. And we are always talking about like this question of commutativity, right? So your POVMs, once they commute, really by this universal property, just what we exemplified here, you get one morphism from the maximum. So now, now you can. Okay, so what you're saying is that um, mm -hmm. if there is somehow an element in the maximal product mm -hmm. that you cannot achieve uh, in, the, no, that does not exist in the minimal product, mm -hmm. this somehow translates to a, commuting POVMs that Alice and Bob can do that they would not be able to do on physically separated spaces. Yes, yeah, so that is like an, a, a, a nice intuition for what will happen, but the, what it is more subtle than that because um, you kind of went the other way around. You went from deducing the equality from knowing that correlation sets coincide. Mm -hmm. But that is, but that's, that not, is, that's not what we will do because it's not even clear it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, we will only do the other direction, which is assuming the much heavier thing that the whole tensor products coincide and then deducing something about like, the, the fact that they co coincide says that you can now replace this with mean. Oh, right? I see. So what you're saying is that, ah, I see. You're saying if the, the maximal and minimal products coincide, mm -hmm. then whatever Alice and Bob can do commuting. Commuting, you can, you can do with tensor product. Right, okay, yeah. That, and this yeah. is just because the morphism from the max turns out to be a morphism from the mean, which is exactly yeah. something yes. in the spatial uh, case and not in the com quantum commuter. Exactly. Right. So here you kind oh, of already. Uh, I see. Okay, and then, ah, uh, but have then. We just to. Sorry. Have we reconvened?
<laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I, I think let's let's say that from this point on, Alon is resuming his talk. He will finish his remark to Guy, and then you should proceed. Yeah, um, I think I will proceed quite uh, uh, immediately just by saying that Guy has the right intuition, and uh, hopefully we will see uh, it will be clear as we move on because I still have a few things to cover. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. I, the fact that you came up with it more or less just shows how natural this correspondence is. And once you have the right tools, like, um, okay, we mentioned what is the minimal tensor product, uh, which uh, last time we mentioned some properties of it, but we will recall them only later if we need them. But now let me demystify what really is C star F2. Okay, so F2 is a group and this construction works for any group. And it's an analog of the usual, what's called group algebra of the group with complex coefficients. But uh, before maybe, I, I won't spend too much time on the exact realization of this object, but let me again kind of specify it by its prop, what it satisfies as a universal prop. So fix a group G we want a, what we will call a f in, in parentheses, full group C star algebra, C, the noted C star G is the algebra with the following universal property. So let me parse this. In this section, this is the data, okay? C star G is some object which is equipped with an embedding of G inside unitaries of C star G, right? In any C star algebra, you have the group of unitaries, just like you have unitary matrices. Okay, so G will be unitaries inside C star G. And the property it satisfies is that if you have a group homomorphism, so this is a group homomorphism, from G to the unitary group of some other C star algebra, so A is some C star algebra, and this is the unitary group, okay? What we want to ask is to extend this map on the level of groups to the level of algebras, okay? So the property that this algebra has is that any group representation, G inside UA, which is, okay, um, classically called just unitary representations of the group G, you can extend them to star homomorphisms from this universal object to the algebra in the range. This pi twiddle, the existence of is guaranteed. Okay, but um, this is kind of uh, what, what this object we would like it to satisfy. But uh, if you really want a, 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 a concrete realization of this, the note CG, this is just the span over C of like formal, formal delta fun, delta masses of elements of G. Okay, this is yeah, what's which called is the fancy name of speaking about polynomials, formal polynomials with coefficients from C, and the monomials are just elements of the group. Uh, this is the group okay. ring. And yeah, exactly. Okay, so Alon, I'll, I'll let you move along, but I'll just say that the group ring also has a relation to unitary representations, right? And a unitary representation is a, Z, is a CG module, right? Exactly. Uh, this is the same universal property. This is the same thing with the maximal tensor product. In the beginning, we had an algebraic object the algebraic tensor product, which satisfied this property that here the property of the group ring, exactly as you say, is that any unitary representation gives a gives the algebra the structure of a CG model, right? And if you look at this diagram, this is this pi twiddle is exactly what defines the model structure. And but but this is just a, I mean. Okay, assuming what you know, know, you know what is a model. Maybe I'll let you continue for something else. But 
Yeah. So, so I mean, this is the, the exact same thing as we did before. We have the group algebra, which uh, in classical representation theory has this diagram property I drew here. And then we define an, a norm, define so uh, some norm, which again will kind of be a super moon over all representations of the group, et cetera, et cetera, and, and complete this thing, you will get C star G. Okay, so it's not, the details here are very similar to before. What we do here is just construct again, a kind of universal object from the algebraic counterpart of the classical group. Okay, but just, just, just to let you get a taste of how, how beastly this object can be, what is F2? F2 going to UN, these are all, uh, I mean, F2 has an insane amount of unitary representations, right? Like every finite group is a quotient of F2. So uh, F2 encodes all unitary representations of finite groups in particular. And the same is true for C star Alan, F2, it will... Mm -hmm. What, I think F2 only has... Yeah, sorry. Two, generated well, two elements. Uh, like yeah, all groups sorry. that are generated by two elements, which, is, which includes all simple groups at least. Uh, yeah, think of F infinity. Thing. F, yeah, infinity. F infinity is better. Okay. Sorry, my mistake. So the, the, whole, the whole thing I just wanted to say here is that F infinity is some kind of universal object that has every, every other group as its quotient. So it basically contains all the representation theory you can think of. And then if you take the C star algebra of it, you, you will get that this will have all the representation theory of all C star algebras. This I also mentioned in the break that every C star algebra is a quotient of this thing. Okay. What is F and, infinity? So F infinity is like a free group on infinite ge amount of generators. So you have A, B, C, A1, A2, and there are no relations between them. But this, this is a side remark just for intuition for those who know. Um, nonetheless, uh, we, have an, we have a construction and now I want to relate it to our C to the N. So recall that the main object, the main type of C star algebra which interested us is just C to the N with pointwise multiplication, right? And I want to say to you, uh, and surely you should know this because you taught me this at some course, I, I'm pretty sure, that the discrete Fourier transform, okay, so let's step by step. You have the cyclic group of order N, right? This is an abelian group. There is the classical discrete Fourier transform, which takes a function on the cyclic group and gives you another function on with N entries, right? And the DFT, what you know, the, the slogan for it is that it translates convolution to pointwise multiplication, right? And if you think about it, here is convolution uh, because here the group is finite. So the, so the completion, everything is finite dimensional. So there is no completion needed. And this is just the, free, uh, the usual group ring. And, and here is convolution and here is pointwise multiplication. So in other words, the discrete Fourier transform gives a, a, a isomorphism between this group C star algebra and the algebra of interest from before, okay? But recall that we wanted collections of POVMs, so we also need to treat three products. And so what, what happens if we take the C star algebra of the free product of, of K copies, for example, of this cyclic group. So like you take K copies of this cyclic group and make elements in them that do not have any relations between the different copies, then you can see like by the various constructions when uh, we, we did is that this free product of groups translates to a free product of the algebras but each algebra is just C to the N, right? So 
in, in total, if we package this free product of groups as gamma, okay, so gamma is a free product of cyclic groups, then you get that the group sister algebra of gamma is just the free product of this abelian algebras we had from before. Okay, so we, we really like realize the whole discussion of our algebras come from, from a specific group. Like this gamma is specified by the Bell scenario, right? We use the same letter where uh, K is the number of questions and, and M is the number of answers. Okay, is, is this, uh, this, the whole point here is just to pass to talking about algebras coming from groups, but is, is this okay? Great, it seems okay because it should be for more familiar stuff. Finally, uh, here's the main uh, theorem which uh, we will try to prove as much as we can of, uh, which really packages this whole lecture together and uh, should, should make a lot of sense. So this is again from Tobias Fritz's paper. Let's read it slowly because there is something that I didn't remind here. So let gamma be a Bell scenario. So this tuple of two integers. Then given the probability distribution, Ah, given a, for the bell, okay, so not, yeah, so this is maybe quantum correlation. Yeah, so, so a correlation, okay, just this P, A, B, X, Y. Okay, these objects we are working with, given such a correlation, I want to give an exact criterion for when it is in the closure of the quantum spatial um, correlations and when it is in a quantum commuting. So as was hinted before by Guy and basically everyone is that the quantum spatial correlations should be inherently connected to the minimal tensor product, right? So the first clause here says that this correlation is in this closure, if and only if there is a C-star algebraic state rho on this tensor product of C-star gamma with itself, such that the correlation has the following formula. So recall that um, this C star gamma is some um, free product of C to the M uh, K times. And so these E A X's are the, just the projections that generate this thing. Like X is the, X is the question and A is the answer. And so what, what this first clause says is that to manufacture a correlation in this set, you need to give me a state on this monstrous tensor product and evaluate it at the generators. Uh, this is very important. If it doesn't make sense or something I said is not clear, please ask. Hello. Mm -hmm. You will explain in a moment why this is true, but. Um... Mm -hmm. Something is still a bit uh, uh, confusing to me. Yeah. We said that a P of V M mm -hmm. is a morphism mm -hmm. from a C to the M mm -hmm. to some operators on some Hilbert space, bounded mm -hmm. operators on some Hilbert space, right? Yes. So I would have expected some relation to these morphisms, but here you just state, you take a state. I talk about state, but this is exactly, right. this is exactly the difference we need to overcome here because correlations are not POVMs, right? They are taking a POVM and measuring a state with respect to them. Here really, the, when I say state, I mean a unit vector and the vector state defines, right? So, I, I mean, the, the formula of getting a correlation, how we define it is we get a POVM, but then we measure a state with respect to it. And, and what I wanted to say is that this operation of measuring with respect to a state exactly translates to not talking about a, a morphism from this algebra, but talking about a state on this algebra. And does that make more or less some sense? 
because really, I, I mean, you're right that we were talking about morphisms, but at some point you evaluate those morphisms with respect to a state. Yeah, so just in general, it doesn't seem to be well-defined, uh, but it should be well-defined, the following thing. So any P of M just does generate uh, a, Ah, okay, you need to choose a state also. Right? Exactly, the, so, the, the second part, yeah, 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 you yeah, didn't yeah. treat now, it. Now I'm, I'm, yeah, so in some sense, okay, let, let me just, uh, maybe I'll try to translate it back to games uh, because mm -hmm. th this was the, lecture, the, the language that we used before. So mm -hmm. if you have POVMs, as we said, you can take um, the inner product of the image of the way the tensor product, the product of the POVM acts on some uh, vector, inner product with this original vector, mm -hmm. right? And this, is, this was the way that we generated uh, these PABXYs. Mm -hmm. And you, sh you say that, okay, let's think of the image of EXA tensor EBY, a P POVM is just choosing an image of what you wrote inside the brackets of rho, mm -hmm. and then taking this inner product is exactly acting with rho on this uh, tensor product. Exactly, the application of rho to, to these generators packages both choosing a POVN and choosing a vector state. It's a composition of a UCP map and a vector state. It will be clear in like two slides, I think, hopefully. But uh, your reasoning is, is, is exactly what happens. But uh, th th does anyone have the, uh, is the statement confusing for anyone or something is unclear? Okay, anyway, it, it should it, make it sense. Is but... it, it is probably both confusing and makes some sense alone, but maybe yeah. you, sh okay. you should so try to both prove it the... and clarify what happens here. Okay, yeah. But uh, before we prove uh, the second clause say exactly the same thing, but here for QC gamma without closure. Okay, the first clause was about the closure of quantum spatial, and the second clause is about all of QC gamma. It says that Q, a, a correlation is in QC gamma if and only if it is the evaluation of a state on the maximal tensor product in the following form. Okay, and okay, so furthermore, this, uh, this gives immediately that QC gamma is closed and convex and coincide, coincides with the set of quantum correlations attainable by projective measurements satisfying the commutativity assumption. So in this proof, we again get the fact that uh, modeling correlations by POVMs, it's enough to model only with projective measurements. Um, but it will, it will be very kind of clear in the proof. Uh, okay, but what, why does this say that QC gamma is indeed closed and convex? So this is the first thing I just wanted to, to put out of the way. So recall that this, the space of states that is positive functionals on this algebra, which are normalized, this is a closed and compact set in what's called the weak star topology, uh, which is just pointwise convergence of functionals. And from our correspondence, we see that uh, okay, we have kind of a map that takes rho, a state here, to rho of E, X, A, tensor E, Y, B, right? And for, and this is a correlation. And this, this thing lands inside Euclidean space. But this map is by definition continuous with respect to the weak star topology. So the image of this compact and convex set, which is exactly QC of gamma, is also compact and convex and, is, and as a result is closed. Okay, so, so we get this closure, closeness of QC gamma as a result of compactness of the state space of this algebra immediately. Cool. So this already gives a non-trivial result. Uh, can you yeah. 
just give I, I will stay for a second for those. Uh, okay. Why is it uh, compact in the weak star topology? So, yeah, this is a, a kind of something I'm putting under the rug, but what you might know is compact in the weak star topology usually is the unit ball in the dual space, right? Yeah. If you have a Banach space, you have the dual space of it, which is the continuous linear functionals, then the functionals of norm one con consists of a weak star compact set. However, the state space, wh what is a state? It's a- uh, You're saying it's a closed subset of- Exactly, uh, it's a closed the... convex subset because positivity is also a closed condition on the weak star topology. Yeah. Okay, and um, now we want to prove it and uh, I will remind, so I'll try to prove as much of it as I can. And um, so for one of the direct, so there are four things to prove like uh, two clauses and for each clause, there are two objects that we need to show that are the same. So before showing one of them, the main ingredient in, in this proof will be that is, is the following proposition, which Daniel kind of proved last time, saying that if you have a UCP map to one Hilbert space and you have a UCP map to another Hilbert space, then the map defined by this tensor product, okay, so is also UCP. So what, what I mean here is that, like, like what Guy was picturing in his head, but now for POVMs on different Hilbert spaces. We have two POVMs on different Hilbert spaces. We want to package them to a map from the minimal tensor product, but to the bounded operators on the tensor product Hilbert space. And of course it maps in the natural map. And all this proposition says is that this indeed can be done. Okay. Uh, but maybe it will be, it will be re from, from this, it's already quite clear what we want to do. Um, so we are now talking about quantum spatial correlations and we want to show that if you are a quantum spatial correlation, then you come from a state on the C star algebra. This is one of the directions. And how do we do it? So you are given a quantum spatial correlation so there are Hilbert spaces HA and HB and a state in HA tensor HB and POVMs, blah, 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 such that the fundamental formula holds for the correlation, right? This is the Fingier formula. Now using this dictionary of fleets, we can consider UCP maps from C star gamma to BHA and HB respectively, which encode this collection of POVMs, right? And then using just the, okay, yeah. And in, they encode indeed in the sense that they send the generators to the corresponding projectors, right? Yeah, by you, the you uh, let's just stop here. This uh, up until this point, like the, the first three lines are just old things than definitions. Everything the here fourth and fifth line is just the fact that, that you said that POVMs are the same as, same as maps, UCP maps from C star gamma to B of H. Exactly. So we just remember that this is true and apply it on the first POVM and the second POVM. Exactly. And then by the, propos the proposition from the previous slide, which I mentioned briefly, you can package these two POVMs to kind of a tensor product POVM. So I can define a single UCP map from the minimal tensor product to the, to the tensor product of the Hilbert space uh, such that, you know, like, uh, like um, on each component restricted, it will be either phi A or phi B. Okay. Now we want to, so what, what was our goal? We were given a, a, a correlation and we want to show it comes from a state. So up till now we defined a UCP and now comes the part where Michal was confused about of composing it with a vector state, right? Because we define 
our state on the C star algebra to be kind of first evaluating the image under this tensor product UCP and then evaluating it on the state C, right? And because what I hinted to Nati that um, a UCP is in fact a positivity condition, then the composition of two positive maps because also taking inner products with respect to a single vector state is a positive operation. This composition will also be positive and thus define a state, oops, on the tensor product, the minimal tensor product. Okay, and it's, I mean, the, the, the equations here are spelled out, but basically all we did above is to a series of translations so that indeed this law evaluated on the generators E's will exactly recover the correlation. Okay, so I, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but it all reduces down to previous translations we did. Okay, cool. Now uh, we do the exact same direction for the quantum commuting case. Okay, so now we are given a quantum commuting correlation and we want it to, to come from a state on the maximal tensor problem. Okay, so here is the, so we, before we had this proposition of, of packaging two POVMs to one tensor product POVM, now we have a very, almost identical proposition, but for to deal with commuting POVMs, okay? So if you have, oops, which is very reminiscent of the universal property of the maximal tensor product, but it reads as follows. If you have two UCPs from different algebras, but to the same Hilbert space, UCP maps, so think of them as POVMs with commuting ranges, so commuting POVMs on the same Hilbert space, then I can take a tensor product of these UCPs to get one UCP from the maximal one to BH, okay, which maps, of course, as you would expect, like takes the tensor product to the just the product of these images. And the, and the claim is that it, this is also a UCP map. If you replaced UCP with just star homomorphism, this would exactly be the universal property that the maximal tensor product possesses. However, it, there is something to explain in order to show, to say it's also true for UCP maps. So if you're working with projective measurements, uh, there's, th this is just a universal property. But then the, the proof proceeds in exactly the same way as just for the minimal one, right? Because now you're given a, a quantum commuting correlation. It gives you commuting POVMs. You take these POVMs, you translate them to UCPs, you tensor product the UCPs using this proposition, and this gives you a state on the maximal one, in exactly the same machinery. Okay, so, so this was passing from correlations to states. Now we want to go the other way around. We, we still have two things to show. We need to show that um, states come from correlations, but in two different scenarios, in the quantum spatial and quantum commuting scenarios. So I'll start with actually the harder scenario of showing that if you have a state on the minimal tensor product, then it can be approximated by quantum spatial correlations, right? This is exactly the difference because quantum spatial correlations are even known to be by, by previous results, not closed. So it, if, if quantum spatial correlations were just evaluations of states on the minimal tensor product, then they would be closed just for the, the same as the maximal one. So we cannot expect to realize states on the minimal tensor products exactly as quantum spatial correlations, but only to be approximated by them. And this is exactly where the proposition we worked so hard to prove last time about approximating states by vector states comes in. So 
um, it appears before you, but just for just to juggle your memory, it says that if you have a state on an, a C star algebra, then you can approximate it by, on, on any finite set of elements you, you fix, so something like in the weak star topology, any finite elements in C you fix, you can approximate this um, state law by vector states coming from H, convex sums of vector states from H. Yeah, this okay. was the discussion of the spectral theorem that we had last time. Yeah, that Dorit in the end said that for all, uh, for finite dimensional beings, you can just think of rho is given by a tracing with respect to an operator and then diagonalizing that operator. So this was the intuition. And so, so Nati and Dorit said. And, but let's use this. Okay, so now, we are given a state on the minimal tensor product, and we want to show it's in the closure of tensor product correlations. So fix a faithful representation of C star gamma. Okay, we said that any C star algebra can be realized in sine BH. Then this gives a, a representation of the minimal tensor product, right? By definition, this is how we define it on, on the tensor product in this way. Now for any epsilon, by the proposition, there are vector states in H tensor H, right? And convex coefficients such that the state evaluated on the generators, because we only have a finite number of generators, is approximated by evaluating these generators on this states, right? But this thing is already a, in C tends in, in the quant in the qu quantum okay in the quantum spatial correlations right this is basically a quantum spatial correlation because you can think of these exa and eybs as even projective measurements and C as a vector state in the tensor product Hilbert space right here we even realized both of them on the same Hilbert space so formally you just take these as your POVM. Like everything here is very universal in some sense. Like this algebra in code, again, like the whole, this proves something, but again, it gives a different way of looking at Silson's problem. It, it, it gives it some, uh, as a problem on one specific object, uh, these tensor problems. So, so, and because, okay, I don't prove here the, tensor product correlations consist of a convex set, you get that this evaluation is approximated by a tensor product correlations, okay? That was that. Now for, for the, so we are left with only one statement to prove, Ken. I'll only yeah, go back to, for a moment. Yeah, I'll let you digest this because this approximation is a, is quite, I, th I think. Uh, no, the, nice this approximation, it, it is clear that each uh, summand in the right hand side mm -hmm. is a, 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 a quantum spatial correlation. This, this is clear because mm -hmm. of the way you just defined it. Um, what's not so clear, mm -hmm. uh, I need again the, ex the explanation of why, if you approximate using some. Uh, linear combination of elements from this set, you get back uh, an element of the set. This is true for convex combinations, but this is not a convex combination. No, this is a convex combination of correlations, right? Like why is I mean, it a convex? Co I, see, I see that it is a linear combination. No, no, ah, I sorry, I didn't write here that some lambda j is one. Ah, uh, this, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's my mistake. <laughs> now now yeah, yeah. clear. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it would be kind of ludicrous. No, th this is clearer. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you for, I didn't notice that. Uh, other questions regarding this direction? 
Great. So, so moving on again, the 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 previous slide that that was the yeah proposition this proposition we proved uh, yeah. with part functional analytical data. So I'm kind of I'm I'm trying to identify what are our x so one. This x one will be e a x and e y b's tensor product. Okay. So recall that our algebra is in some sense yeah. finitely generated. Yeah. It's, it's important. We only have a finite amount of questions and answers. So indeed, we can do this approximation. Great, thanks. Great. OK, now that's nice and all. Let's proceed to the last part, which is showing that a state on the maximal tensor product comes exactly from a quantum commuting correlation. And thus, this kind of shows that these quantum commuting correlations consists of a closed set. So this just uses the G flexibility of the GNS construction, uh, which we also mentioned last time, but I think I have a bit of time to just recall it now. So think of a state on an algebra A, then the GNS theorem or explicit construction even says that there is a triple pi phi, h phi, and c phi, where h phi is a Hilbert space, pi phi is a star homomorphism from a to b h phi, and c phi is a, a cyclic vector. Okay, cyclic, please ignore it. I mean, it's beside the point here now. And c phi in h phi, a vector of norm one, so a state such that phi of a is realized as a vector state once you apply pi to it, right? Before the approximation theorem said that you can approximate phi with vector states, but in the same presentation, a representation, but once you allow yourself to change the representation, I can just say, okay, I can build some, a representation pi phi and a vector there such that phi will really just be uh, evaluating with respect to this vector state. Exactly, not approximately. Okay, that's nice and all because now we can use it to prove our remaining direction. Uh, let, I think it will be clear, very clear why we need this exact formulation. So now, now you are given a rho, a state on the maximal tensor product. And you want to show it comes from commuting POV, the quantum commuting correlation. So the genus representation says that there exists a Hilbert space H rho, a representation pi rho from the maximal, I will maybe use the highlighter, from the maximal tensor product to BH rho, and a unit vector C in H rho, such that this exact formula holds. Okay, but kind of now it's just, we can take these to be our PVNs, right? Because pi is a representation. So evaluating these um, generators under it, this Fritz's dictionary gives you a PVN, right? Because, uh, okay. And because they are defined from a map on the maximal tensor product, these are commuting PVNs, right? And, and I mean, basically here, everything is tautological. Once you realize that up to changing a, presenta a representation, you can realize your state as a vector state. Because here indeed, um, you will have that C of A, B, X, Y will just be this, this is, sorry. So what is the GNS uh, formula guaranteeing you? It's guaranteeing you this. This is what is guaranteed by the GNS construction, but, but, you can, but this is the same formula as this, right? With these POVMs. So this is by definition quantum commuting correlation. That's it, unless something seems off to you. 
I mean, I mean that's it all the magic happened to... all the magic happened because we have this GNS construction that only needs a state right exactly. like the magic of GNS is that if you have a state you can construct a representation and yeah the state behaves exactly like this inner product with a specific unit vector and thus we can reconstruct uh, the setting of of a quantum commuting model. Exactly. But because this GNS representation, we construct this Hilbert space and it's not, I mean, this construction doesn't yield necessarily a tensor product Hilbert space. Like before, when we proved for the minimal tensor product, we, we kind of wanted this approximation because we really didn't want to change our representation. We wanted it to be H tensor H. But because we are talking about the quantum commuting correlation, which can take any representation we want, not necessarily a tensor product representation. So, I mean, this proof also like kind of um, clarifies the, the difficulties with each model. Uh, they are flexible on the one hand and easy on the other hand. And it's, it's quite, uh, you, you will really need to realize which ones you need. But okay, but now for closing off the lecture, I just wanted to, after all this work, what we have done, we have shown that QWEP, ah, okay, so fact, QWEP meaning C star F2, I will write this strength notation tensor mean, like tensor with itself, and C star F2 tensor with itself here, max, this is the QWP conjecture. But the fact is that this is equivalent to having for any slash sum gamma equals MK, which is not 2, 2, that the same thing holds just with gamma instead of F2. Intuitively, this is because we are talking about three products here, right? So this is already like really reducing to a mathematical slash group theoretic or C star algebraic question. I'm just saying that, sorry, I'll write this clearer. This question on, on the free group is the same question for any one of these free products of cyclic groups. And maybe also relating again to Nati's question, I mean, in Silson's problem, it wasn't clear that once there is inequality in some Km, then there's inequality in all Km. However, this is true on the level of maximal and minimal tensor products. Like once we knew that there is some Mk, which is not 2, 2, for which these differ, all of them differ. There cannot be any two which are equal. And why 2, 2? Notice that gamma, if gamma equals 2, 2, then gamma is uh, like Z2, free product with Z2. This is what's called the infinite dihedral group, which is amenable. Like this is kind of a special case where your group is amenable and then this would follow, it follows. I mean, actually, this is another fun fact, which I will not say now, but you can characterize amenability as having a unique tensor product with every other C sound. So in our case, the group is amenable, in particular, the, the C star, the tensor product with itself will be unique and will have equality. And this says, for example, that CHSH cannot separate and CQC and CQS. Right, which I think Michal mentioned, but uh, from here it's really clear. I mean, once you believe all I the- I think we even, I think we even saw the proof because we showed Cyrilson's upper bound and this, in the case of CHSH, this is just the proof yeah. of this, uh, for the specific game. What you just explained is a much, most, much more general. Yeah, but I think the more. same, yeah, exactly. But, the, but it's the same idea in the sense that irreducible representations of D infinity are, I think, just finite dimensional. Like it's, it's virtually abelian, right? I'm not, I'm not confused. 
-hmm. and it's very amenable and, and um, kind of you cannot, the representation theory is, here is much more restrictive compared to the free group, for example, so that the equality follows. Uh, and even for yeah, another- the infinite, the, the infinite translation, the, like translations uh, are a normal subgroup, which is yes. uh, finite index and, uh, and abelian, even cyclic. I must say that for the graph theorists in the audience, mm -hmm. the uh, Cayley graph of ZM tensor ZM is uh, always a tree and uh, it, uh, and this is the only case where it is a straight line. Yeah, exactly. So this is why, the, like, you can see the amenability in the graph. Uh, so all trees are non-amenable except for the straight line. Uh, so uh, this is another way, maybe more graph theoretic, to think about this uh, this special case. Yeah. So let me just pose a question, like not this question formally, because. I couldn't find a straight answer to it. I believe there isn't a straight answer to it. Is it true that for any MK not equals to two, that Q tensor product of gamma is different than Q uh, commuting of gamma? Because I told you that on the level of C star algebras, this is true on this maximal and minimal things, but um, I didn't talk about it here. You would expect that our, our dictionary was so complete you would expect that if Zillison's problem was true, also QWEP would be true, right? Like the direction some of you tried to prove. However, it's not so straightforward. And um, as far as I looked in the literature, oh, it's true that Zillison implies uh, QWEP or more precisely comes embedding, but uh, I haven't seen the fact that um, once you know that for some MK, they, these differ then for any MK they differ. I'm not sure even if it's true, but uh, uh, well, I think that, uh, that at least from the talks that I've heard about this topic, that this is still open. Like what are the M and Ks, even though we know that there are MKs that for, for them, this is different. The set of MKs for such that this is different, as I understand yeah. it now, is an open question. Uh, yeah, but but what I'm saying, I, I pose this as a question because it's kind of tempting, again, because on the level of C star gammas, this is true. I, I, I mean, from-, from Yeah, I, I understand why you say that yeah. after this talk, this is a very natural thing Wait, to assume like for any, like mm -hmm. th this is a good conjecture after seeing your talk. But as you said, uh, it seems that mm -hmm. although Quep uh, implies, like the other implication is also true, Mm -hmm. This is still open. Yeah. Sorry, Guy? Yeah, so I don't think I follow the last bit. And so... So, 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 so what I'm referring when, to... When is, do you know that... Um, okay. Guy, so, he's mentioning that there is the inequality on the level of sister algebras, the, whether the minimal tensor product is equal to the maximal one. Yeah. And there is the equality on the level of correlation sets. Right. And he says that in the, okay, on the level so of let me, just, uh, let me first just get the directions correctly. So if there is inequality in the correlations, uh, then an inequality between the man and, mean and the max follows. Yes, that is true. Uh, the opposite. I guess it's not clear? Not clear. Uh, I mean, what, if you ask it for all MK, then it's true, but in kind of a, a indirect way. I mean, Ozawa, I, I mean, this is all contained in works of Ozawa, uh -huh. uh, where he, he shows that once you assume Silson's problem for all MK, you can prove Kohn's embedding conjecture. He proves that every, separable to one factor is cons embeddable, whatever that means. And it's known that cons embedding conjecture is, is equivalent to QWEP. So okay, like but that's somehow a weird 
indirect way. So it's it, yeah, so yeah. You 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 don't go through this. I don't think you go through this uh, correspondence we established here. I see. So you don't know how to just take like one element in the max product that mm -hmm. is not in the min product and somehow generate a game uh, that. Uh, no, the thing is, uh, okay, I will say this is very confusing. It took me a lot of time with the Neil to figure out why, why isn't the other direction true. Let me, let me scroll back to the, to the actual statement. Yeah. Okay. Notice the correlation only remembers the value of the state on the generators, right? So saying Zillerson says that all these states coincide on generators, but states are, the fact that states coincide on generators, these are generators as algebra generators, doesn't mean that they coincide everywhere. Uh, so, so I mean- the, what, Wait, so what you were saying is that a state, so you were saying that there could be a state that- uh, There could be two states. That, that it, okay. That One agree is, on the generators, but differ on some other elements. That, right. That's the potential yeah, so, problem okay. that so, you can have. I see. So somehow it's not enough to have a state that's in the set B and not in the set in, yeah, in the max product and not in the min product, you need such a state to be, uh, yeah. No, no, no. Ah, no, no sorry. Okay. The, you can have such a state, but maybe there's another state which identifies with it. On the generators. On the generators. Exactly. It's not, yeah, I see. So the problem here is really this thing and maybe- and this, this can this... actually happen, like two states can really- So I don't, in general, yes, but um, for this situation, again, I don't think it's so clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually this raises another direction which people utilize. I think also a result Michael mentioned of like semi-definite programming for approximating the quantum commuting value from above. Because um, here you can employ the, some facts about semi-algebraic sets and show that th this maximal tensor product is, I, I really, I haven't read it clearly, but um, some general procedure uh, in some general procedure, you can approximate this maximum norm or this evaluation uh, under states from above. With the, but again, this procedure is, the, the whole point here is that states are not multiplicative and to approximate them on different combinations of the generators, uh, you need some other arguments, I guess. But, uh, Again, this is this is relating already to what's called operator systems, and um, and this is why, for example, names like PZL and Blaston, like th these are questions which were also studied by operator algebraists uh, for the sake, uh, because th these are already really Hello. subtle things. May okay. Maybe anyway, let us, uh, maybe let us thank you, and then uh, people who need to leave uh, will leave. Sorry. Thank you, Alon. It was really, really, really great. I'll just say that for, regarding your last remark, I hope that we will see this uh, algorithm. There mm -hmm. is an algorithm of uh, approximating uh, the uh, quantum commuting value of a game from above. Uh, and this is uh, Navasco, Spironio, and the scene. Uh, and this is a uh, a very important part of the MIP star is equal to RE. Uh, it's not part of the, the like, it's part of understanding why it is true. It's not part of the paper. And um, hopefully we will What for we'll next week? Um, okay, so I'll talk next week and I'll publish my abstract and title during the week. Uh, there are two options. Maybe I'll also discuss with you guys or it and so on about it. So, uh, so it will be revealed. Okay. Thank you again. Okay, Tana. See you next week. Toda. Thank you. Um, Guy, can I ask you why why you say all the time if there's um something in the max that is not in the min, is the min 
inside the Mac? Like, do, is the... States. It means that uh, you, you want to relate somehow uh, states coming from the... Uh, you, you want to say that there exists a state on the Max that cannot be... Value, yes. like achieved using a state on the mean and uh, like this is the way he thinks of it right yeah exactly yeah so like you get yeah. in, the in general space. the maximal product contains the minimal product that's well, what i'm trying to understand but, but it's uh, right. you don't think is it does it no 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 but maybe let me clear it up we said that okay think of this as the max this is as the mean Okay, we said the minimal is a quotient of the maximum, right? Because there is a surjective map from the maximal one to the minimal. Yeah. But now Guy, Guy was talking on the level of states. So functional is defined on these algebras. So, so if you like pre-compose states- So you can pull back. So you do the pull exactly. back and, okay. In fact, like it's even having a nicer structure. This is what's called the face of the convex set. Like, the states inside B will be a face of the convex set uh, S A in the sense of the string points and such, Shukhe synthesis and such things. Mm -hmm. But then, yes, yeah, so, 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 I mean, this is an iso, this will be an equality if and only if this is an equality. So the equality of the algebras is the same thing as uh, the state spaces coincide, being homeomorphic or con being like uh, convex uh, isomorphic. A pullback of, of a quotient map is always um, injective? Uh, no, the point yeah. is that any function, think of it as, and, as this way, any functional on B defines a functional on A. Yeah, right? no, that's the pullback. Two but if two functionals disagree on B, like they, they will surely disagree on some pre-images in A because you are on to. Right, so the because disagreement of the subject, can be, yes. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So you just proved what I asked. Yeah, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, this question of uh, wh when the maximal product is equal to the mean product, is it like interesting in general? Because here yeah. it seems that we are for some reason only interested in, in it for some very specific uh, sister algebras. Yeah, so maybe let me really justify why, why it's um, interesting, even from completely different question. Like, uh, you, you know, you heard of what is an amenable group? Or heard no, the I term? I heard yeah. the term many times and also learned the definition many times. <laughs> and I still see. don't really remember what it means, but. Yeah. So here I can now define to you amenability without pain. Okay. Okay. So gamma is amenable. This is a very important definition. I, I mean, the real definition, but this is on, if and only if for any A, a C star algebra, you have the equality that C star of gamma tensor minimal with A will be equal to C star well, gamma. Maximal. Uh, yeah, exactly. that, that you just said a few minutes ago. Exactly. But that's very opaque. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean? I mean, I, 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 have, I don't know more about what amenable groups are now after you said mm -hmm. it than before you said it, except I agree. one very specific fact. I agree, yes. So, so, I mean, this is very interesting given that you know that amenability Guy, uh... is mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I think maybe a good uh, wait. Wait, you heard maybe of. Yeah, and Yeah, maybe.